True Canadian Wendigo Stories The Walker of the Snow They had been out hunting moose north of Rat Portage, and after a long and fruitless day, were making their way back to camp through a desolate and benighted valley. I say Defarge, slow up, old man, the hunter said. I'm knackered. He couldn't help but notice that Defarge was looking extremely uncomfortable, and, if he hadn't known better, he might have imagined the brawny guide was frightened. Something wrong, old man? This valley ain't a good place to be in, he answered shortly. Why, is there snow coming? A snow squall? Maybe. Maybe something worse. I'll tell you as we go, boss, but we have to make tracks. We can't let darkness catch us in this here valley. And so Hunter and Guide picked up the pace as Defarge spoke. It was December. I had been out on the trap lines and was trying to make it back to camp. But the snow was deep and I got behind time and come through this here valley round the midnight hour. It was an awful quiet place, too damn quiet, and I began to feel plumb lonesome, and something else I didn't understand. And so I decided to sing to cheer myself up, eh? Old voyager songs like. It did cheer me up. After I'd been serenading the moon and stars a while, I realized I wasn't alone. There was a man standing in the trees beside the trail, sort of keeping up with me as I snowshoed along. I sang out to him, yelling for him to come and join me, but he didn't say nothing. I kept going along, and he kept pace with me, but still he didn't say nothing. It took me funny, but then I began to get mad, and started towards him, and then... Defarge fell silent. And then... The hunter prompted. It ain't good to talk about. Damn it, man, don't leave me hanging like that. Well, boss, you know me, eh? You know I'm regular. Yes, yes, man, do get on with it. I began wondering if someone meant to do me harm, and my hand went natural to my knife. I ain't as scared of no man. But what if it weren't a man, eh? You mean like a grizzly, what? Boss, as if I wouldn't know a grizzly. Then what are you driving at? Boss, have you ever heard tell of the walker of the snow? Eh, what is that? Well, some call it the walker of the snow. Others call it the phantom hunter. The natives call him Wendigo. He has a heart of ice and comes with the snow and takes men away. Old wise tales. Defarge stopped in his tracks and turned to look the hunter straight in the eye. No, they ain't. The hunter was taken aback. After a moment he said, Sorry, old man. Tell me what happened. I had come up close to him, Defarge said as he turned to resume walking. I'd come up close to him, but I couldn't make him out. He was all misty-like. Insubstantial? I think that's right. Anyways, I couldn't see him proper. And I weren't sure he was a man. I made off at speed, but I'd be damned, but he kept up with me. As if he were my shadow, eh? I kept throwing looks at him and watches what he does. And there was a moon that night, boss, eh? Well, after a time, I noticed my pursuer... He don't leave no tracks in the snow behind him. No tracks at all. And he don't leave no shadow either. Like he ain't really there. Like he ain't human. I try to move faster, but I can't get away from him. The weather turns colder. Really bloody cold. And the moon, he goes away as the night gets cloudy. And darker. Really pitch. And I can't see my companion so good no more. But I know he's still there, walking with me. And I think he's getting closer. A snow devil suddenly swirls up and hits me flush in the face. And then I was swallowed up in a blizzard, the snow coming down so hard, I can't see me hand afore me. And then he was there afore me, 
and I gazed into his black eyes. So cold. So cold. And then I couldn't move and was drowned in snow. Dusk had fallen, as had the temperature, and it began to snow, lightly, just flurries. The men hurried on. I would have froze to death, sure, but a party had come looking for me and, and pulled me out of the drift where they found me. I was okay, but my hair and beard were like you see now. They had turned as white as the very snow. I never told anyone about what happened, just you, boss. But I had seen him. Wendigo, or the walker of the snow, whatever you want to call him. I had looked him in the very eye, and I ain't been myself since. He took something from me. Defarge is frightened, the hunter told himself, and he found he had unconsciously picked up his step, his stride matching that of his guide. It began to snow harder. Much harder. Big, thick flakes, whipped up by a bitter wind. The temperature was still falling, and Hunter found he had to strain to keep up with his guide. I say, Defarge, how far are we from... Defarge? Defarge? It was a sudden and total whiteout. The Hunter, blinded, reached out to make contact with the guide, but he wasn't there. Defarge? He was suddenly seized by a pair of rough hands, and suddenly found himself face to face with Defarge. It may have been the snow and the falling light, but the guide appeared changed, his demeanor radically altered, animalistic. Defarge's eyes were totally black, totally cold, and the hunter found he was drawn into them, drowning in them, just as he was being suffocated with snow. He took something from me, boss. Something. And I've been hungry ever since. Hungry. All the time hungry. And I gotta have meat. Meat! A philosophical question. Is a scream in the forest still a scream if nobody hears it? Nobody human, that is. Real Canadian Wendigo Stories Wendigo Island In 1869, a logging crew came to winter on an isolated island in Grand Lac Manitou, Wendigo Island. Native Canadian hunters refused to trap on the island, even though it harbored plenty of game, but they would leave fine animal pelts and tobacco as offerings to the Wendigo spirit. Wendigo the cannibalistic walker of the snows. It would have been a good place to winter, but for the foreman, Big Jim Bonneau. Bonneau was a brawny, balding, foul-mouthed and bad-tempered bully who wore a silver whistle on a chain around his thick neck, the better to torment others. Rumor had it that Big Jim had bought the whistle and chain down in old Quebec, from old Nick himself, Satan. Bonneau would blow the whistle to summon the men to work or to announce lights out in the bunkhouse. He would also blast it when he wanted to express his anger at a logger he didn't reckon was working as hard as he should. Big Jim was so mean, he even hated music. At night, when the men would sing old songs to the accompaniment of concertina and fiddle, this damnable man would blow his whistle and holler, Lights out, you goddamn sons of bitches! And Big Jim blew his cussed whistle whenever he wanted Orphan Johnny. Orphan Johnny was a 12-year-old native Canadian boy who had lost both parents 
and who had attached himself to the camp as a shanty boy. Bonneau treated Johnny like a slave and would summon him at all hours of the day and night to wait on him. Fetch this, you. Bring that. Hurry up. Hurry up, you worthless dog. Hurry up or I throw you out to starve. And if Johnny wasn't quick enough, he would suffer Bonneau's massive fists. His philosophy was to hit first and swear after. Not that he wasted any grub on the boy. What? Feed him? Feed that worthless dog? Let him earn his grub by doing something right first. Right for a change, stupid idiot. Indeed, if the cook and the men hadn't shared their rations with Johnny, he probably would have died from exhaustion and malnutrition. One day, a logger named Murphy saw Johnny burying something in a snowdrift along the edge of the shore. He waited until the boy had gone and then went to investigate. It was a rabbit Johnny had snared in one of his traps. Johnny is honoring his native gods, Murphy said to himself. It must be an offering to the Wendigo spirit. Murphy reburied the rabbit. Who was he to interfere with the Wendigo? As the winter progressed, the temperature dropped and the drifting snow piled higher and higher. On a particularly frigid day, Bonneau and Murphy went to scout for fresh timber and returned to the camp just as the howling winds announced a coming blizzard. Bonneau had been warming his hands in front of the pot-bellied stove when he suddenly began to stamp his feet and holler in a voice edged with hysteria. My whistle! Son of a bitch! She is gone! And my chain too! Son of a bitch! Gone! Some of the loggers may have been tempted to laugh, but the fear of Bonneau's massive fists kept their mouths shut and their faces blank. Big Jim seized Orphan Johnny with his huge hands and began shaking him. You, you's worthless son of a bitch. You's go out and fetch them back or don't bother to show your ugly face in here no more. When Murphy and some of the other loggers protested, they were told, You's think I feed this stupid son of a bitch for nothing, eh? Either he brings me back my whistle or... or... He can go to the devil. And with that, Big Jim pushed the boy out into the now howling storm. It was a miserable evening. No one spoke. What were his chances of survival? The men lay on their bunks, listening to the sound of the encroaching storm. But after a while, they became aware of a change. To the shrieking of the wind, and the patter of the snow, there came a series of loud taps, as if someone, or something, walked around the building, knocking, or pounding, on the log walls. Murphy, worried it was Orphan Johnny, went to look out the frost-encrusted window, and found himself staring into the face of an adult Native Canadian man. But was it a man? The features seemed coarse and misshapen, the eyes two pools of blackness, which, to quote Edgar Allan Poe, gave off an unceasing radiation of gloom. Murphy glimpsed it but a moment, then it vanished into the swirling snow. And then the voice was heard. Let me in. I'm so cold. Let me in. So cold. So cold. The voice sounded like Orphan Johnny's. Big Jim yelled, Where's my whistle, hey? You bring it back? The voice was heard again. Let me in. I'm so cold. Let me in. So cold. So cold. Bring back my whistle or freeze in hell, Big Jim bellowed. Let me in. I'm so cold. Let me in. So cold. So cold. No one moved. No one said anything. The voice sounded like Johnny's, but it was somehow unnatural and kept repeating the same words over and over. 
until it eventually stopped. The fire in the pot-bellied stove died out, and the bunkhouse was plunged into frigid cold. Hey, use Murphy. Go out to the woodpile and bring in some wood, hey? Not I, said Murphy. It's death to go outside this night. Big Jim tried Jeru and some of the others, but they all refused. They were more afraid of what lay outside than they were of Big Jim's violence and fists. The foreman scowled but said nothing more, burying himself underneath the blankets in a vain attempt to keep warm. The men lay silent, listening to the sounds of the storm. And then there was a knock at the door. Nobody moved. No sound but that of the storm swirling around the shanty. No words. But suddenly, the shrill blast of a whistle. A whistle. It blew again. And again. With an oath and a roar, Big Jim leaped from his bunk and stamped and staggered towards the door, moving forward like he couldn't stop himself from moving. Someone yelled, Don't open that door. Big Jim cried, his face white with fear. I, I can't. He's got me. It's got me. The door flew open before Big Jim could even reach it, and he instantly vanished in a fog of swirling ice and snow, and then was gone. Gone. But fading into the distance, the lumberjacks could hear the mingled sounds of Big Jim's shrieks and the blasts of his damn silver whistle. After a few minutes, Murphy got up and shut the door. The storm slowly died away. In the morning, after the sun had risen, the men went outside to look for Big Jim and Orphan Johnny. They found prints left by snowshoes in the snow, each about the size of two sleighs parked end to end, about 25 feet. They weren't Big Jim's prints. Of him, there was no sign at all. Orphan Johnny was cold, but alive and unharmed, having buried himself like a husky under the snow. But Big Jim and his silver whistle were never seen or heard from again. Real Canadian Wendigo Stories A Tale of the Grand Jardin it had been a remarkable day for Trout, and we only quit fishing when the falling darkness and the sudden onset of a tempestuous cloudburst forced us to seek shelter in our tent, in self in danger of blowing away. The rest of the party had gone to town to seek provisions, leaving us with only pork and stale biscuit. The storm was too intense to make tea or cook fish, and would prevent our friends from returning so all we could do was sit and smoke and stare out the tent flap as lightning illuminated the raging river. Sit and smoke and yarn. We were in the Grand Jardin des Ors, one of the loneliest spots in the Laurentians, hence the spectacular fishing. It was a bleak area of granite, lichen, and moss, and we were probably the only human beings found amidst its desolation. Do you know anything about Paul Dugas? Heard anything about him? He vanished, didn't he? My companion didn't answer directly, but said, It was Dugas who first brought me here, back before there were any trails or visitors, other than some Montagnier Indians. He was like a madman, always on the move, never stopping for rest or even food. And if he was following any trails, I couldn't see them. Still, he led me to superb fishing, as you have experienced. What happened to him? Who knows? 
Bushmania? The Call of the Wild? He went into the woods without weapons or grub. It wasn't seen for an entire month, until he appeared, a wreck of a man at his father's door. He survived the winter, more vegetable than man, and was gone again in the spring. And no one has seen him since? My friend hesitated again, so I repeated my question. According to the Montagnais, a person who dies mad in the wilderness becomes a wendigo, a sort of werewolf with a taste for flesh, or at least some sort of cannibal. Some whispered Dugas had suffered such a fate. He listened to the sounds of the falling rain, then said, Dugas had told me of a volcanic lake, headwaters of the Riviere L'Enfer, the river of hell. Apparently the lake was home to monster trout, but he always refused to guide me there. After Dugas' disappearance, I determined to find it, and find it I did. It's not far from here as the crow flies. The water was black as ink and deep. My soundings could never reach bottom. We pitched our tent on sand as black as the lake itself, and as we were short of supplies, I sent my men back to town, planning to spend the day in solitary fishing. They were to be back by sunset, but as the day went on, I began to feel increasingly uneasy. The sun began to fade and was then eclipsed by low scudding clouds, while the surrounding peaks became dark and ominous. As the wind picked up, I secured the canoe and went to see to the tent, just as the storm hit with a rush and a roar. The rain and thunder were deafening, but above the tumult, I thought I could hear something. It came again and I realized it was a bestial cry or scream, more animal than human. I gripped the pole of the tent and wished my men had come back. The cry came again, closer, with a pitch of agony, like an animal whose insides had been torn, twisted out, and I found my knife was in my hand. Hello, I sang out. Not that I expected a reply, at least not a human one. But the reply came, a loud, agonizing mixture of hatred and distress, and it was right outside the opening of the tent. I forced myself to look, and there, standing in the torrential rain, was a hulking, panting, shadowy figure. There was a blaze of lightning. I screamed, and it was upon me, fang and claw. I dived into the Stygian waters of the Lake of Hell, and somehow made it through the surging billows to the other side, where I staggered frantically down the trail. I could hear it lumbering after me, making the darkness hideous with its yowls. I didn't stop running until I came to where my men had been forced to camp for the night. I was safe. We left the next day. I've never been back there, but, but this spot is damn close too damn close. Who or, or what was it? He was quiet again, then said somberly, I pray to the good God it wasn't the remains of Paul Dugas. There was a lull in the storm, and in that instant it came, the most atrocious and appalling outcry I had ever heard, a wail that no human being could make. We looked out. It stood just outside the tent. It had been a man once, and then it sprang. The Drifting Snow My dad recently retired, and he and Mom decided to spend the winter in sunny Arizona, leaving me in charge of the family home. The good news? I get the house to myself. The bad news? I live on the Canadian prairies, and it's winter. Only October, and we already have snow on the ground. A lot of it. 
In fact, so much of it, I'm snowed in. They even canceled classes at the university, which is a good thing for me, as I'm behind in all my courses. <sighs> Too much partying. And this is a chance to catch up on my work. I spent the evening watching the snow swirling outside my window and pounding away on the keyboard. Nobody even texted me. I guess they're all frantically working away too. But finally, after midnight, I had to knock off. But I was too keyed up to even think about sleep. So I cracked a cold one. Yeah, I know, it's cold outside, but it's a dry cold, right? And I was thirsty. And I decided to check out some of the more outre stuff on YouTube. I was nodding off to the dulcet tones of Mortis Media when I was suddenly wide awake. Mord had been interrupted by some sleep-killing ad for something I didn't want. I lolled in my chair for a few minutes, too tired, or too lazy, to get up and go to bed properly. Indeed, I felt so wasted. I might have stayed there all night. But I had been drinking beer, so I had to take a leak. I wobbled onto my feet, glancing out the window as I did so. There was a flicker of movement outside the window. I, I forced my bleary eyes to focus, but all I could see was the falling snow and the vague outline of the three trees in the backyard. It was snowing so hard, I couldn't even see the houses on the other side of the yard. I, I thought the movement was probably caused by my reflection, lit by the light from my monitor on the glass on the inside of the window. Well, I went about my business, then came back to shut things down for the night, plunging the room and the whole house into darkness. I took one last look at the storm outside. There was a flicker of movement. I focused, and at the side of the center tree, there was a shadow as if someone was standing behind it and had their hand on the side of the tree trunk. I moved closer to the window and squinted, trying to see through the swirling mist, but all I could see was white, the trunks of the trees, little more than shadowy forms. One, two, three, and four. Four? There's only three trees. I, I blinked and looked again. Yeah. Yeah. Only three trees. I need to go to bed and get some sleep. But even as I turned away, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone, or something, was watching me. Ah, shit, man. Just go to bed. But when I got into bed, I found I still couldn't sleep. Still too keyed up. I'd been working too hard and then seeing things in the backyard. I'll be glad when the snow stops and I can get back to class, you know, see people and stuff. The backyard security light suddenly came on. It lit up the entire room, and I ran to the window and looked out. The, the light was motion-sensitive and was usually triggered by wildlife. Or an intruder. I looked into the backyard, but all I could see was drifting snow and the three sentinel trees. Whatever had set off the light was gone. Must have been some poor starving jackrabbit, I muttered returning to bed. I shut my eyes, and then the backyard security light came on again. I ran out and looked again, out the back window, then checked the side window and the front window. 
Nothing. Must be the falling snow that triggers it, I told myself. Although I couldn't explain why the light was coming on now, seeing as it had been snowing all night. The light came on again as soon as I lay down, but I said, Ah, to hell with it. And then I felt the chill. I was lying in bed in a nice warm house, but I suddenly found myself shivering, not with physical cold, but with dread, sheer icy dread. There was something out there in the snow, something that was aware of me and wanted to harm me. And I was in here alone. No point in trying to call or text anyone, because no one could get here in this storm. And then I heard it. Jordan. Jordan. Come outside, Jordan. Come outside. <sighs> I relaxed. It had to be a joke. Someone pranking me. I wanted to laugh out loud. But then my brain kicked in. Who would be playing a practical joke in the middle of a howling blizzard? Didn't I see on the TV? All the roads are closed right now. Everybody's staying inside tonight. Everybody... human? Jordan. Come outside, Jordan. I put on a pair of headphones and cranked up the volume, determined to drown the voice out with music. But no matter how high I turned up the sound, I could still hear it calling to me. And even worse, even worse, I wanted to go to it, go outside in the snow and, and join it. Whatever it was, I wanted to be with it. And that's when it started pounding on the walls of the house. It started at the back of the house, first on the outer walls, and then on the windows. I almost jumped up to look, but I didn't want to see what was out there, see it peering in through the darkness at me. I didn't want to see what it was. It moved around the house, smacking the walls and calling out to me until it reached my bedroom and stayed. It, and I could only think of my unknown antagonist as it, began hitting the wall so hard, I became terrified that it was going to smash through and grab me. I was about to start yelling at it, to tell it to fuck off and leave me alone. But I didn't want to let it know where I was, let it know it was getting to me. And I didn't want to make any kind of contact with it, any kind of contact, so it couldn't gain any further power over me or gain a stronger hold on my mind, if that makes any sense. In the end, I did the only thing I could think of. I pulled the blankets over my head and hid underneath the covers. And in a while, it went away. And in a while, I relaxed. And in a while, I fell asleep. I woke up. I woke up cold. Freezing cold. Had the furnace cut out? What a time to be without heat. But then I felt the cold air, which was flowing in waves down the hallway and into the bedroom. Was there a door open somewhere? A, a door to the outside? I wanted to get up and stop myself. Was the thing from outside in the house? What was it? I was about to yell, Who's there? But fear stopped me, dead. It, it may have been the smell, which I can only describe as a musty, feral odor, which gave me a mental image of forests 
in the great outdoors, but also of carrion, dead things. There was something in the hall. The open doorway was a gray triangle against the darkness of the bedroom where I lay. And as I watched, a shadowy figure filled the aperture. It was tall, incredibly tall, almost touching the ceiling, but was thin to the point of emaciation. It was white with frost and covered in places with dark clumps of matted fur but I found myself staring at the fingers or claws, long, skeletal, and black, black as death, as were the thing's eyes, huge, dark, penetrating orbs that transfixed me as if it could see and read my very soul, read my very soul and rip it out of me like it was ripping out my heart. It just stood there in the open doorway, staring at me, and I was afraid that any second it would begin calling me by name. Jordan. Jordan. So I shut my eyes and put my hands over my ears. And when I eventually opened my eyes, it was gone. But the cold remained. The snow finally stopped at dawn. But everything outside my frosty windows is gray and overcast. I'm fully dressed, including a sweater and windbreaker underneath my parka. Yeah, I'm wearing a parka indoors. I'm so cold, it's like my heart has turned to ice. I have the furnace running at 85 Fahrenheit or 30 Celsius. Any higher, and I'm afraid it would catch fire. I've just finished drinking a bottle of the old man's scotch, and, I, and I've started in on a bottle of brandy. I keep splashing Tabasco into my drinks. Maybe I'll drink the Tabasco next, straight up. I just can't get warm. Just can't, just, just, just can't get warm. Except for my feet, which are burning and swollen. So, so hot and swollen. I've gone barefoot. <laughs> I'm barefoot and wearing a parka. A parka and bare feet. I want to go out and cool my burning feet in the lovely white snow, in the wonderful, 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 lovely white snow. But I'm so cold and, and afraid. I think the thing is still out there, just outside, waiting for me in the gray murkiness. It's no longer calling to me. It, it, it doesn't have to, because I'm going to have to leave soon. I've already eaten all the meat I could find in the fridge and in the freezer downstairs, but I'm still hungry. Oh, so hungry. Hungry! Hi, WSJ here. Thank you for listening. Uh, YouTube videos are like chips. Yeah, after that story, I'm hungry too. YouTube videos are like chips. One is never enough. So if you enjoyed this video, why not check out some of my earlier videos? Please comment and drop a like and consider subscribing for more Wendigo, real Canadian Wendigo stories and ghost stories of a librarian. Till next time. Bye for now, and remember, stay hungry.